Does this sound like me? Okay. I come from a tradition where it's very much just people standing on stage and reading things, so I feel like it's, um, it's true to myself to stay as close to that as possible. Plus, I can't remember what I have to say. So, um, I'm Daniel Chapman. I'm the editor of uh, the City Talking newspaper, which I hope um, you've seen around Leeds and gradually around York, Sheffield, Manchester fairly soon. Belgrave is actually one of our main places to pick it up, so downstairs it should be some if you're intrigued by any of what follows. It's, um, it's a newspaper produced by Hebe Works, who a lot of whom are sort of sitting crowding winningly around the front row here um, to give me a little bit of help, and a couple at the back who have just snuck in. Um, and Hebe is quite a complicated company to explain much as a lot of what the city talking does is quite a complicated thing to explain. But it lives in a place that I think is relevant to what Liam was talking about, where he talks about the requirement of um, engaging with a city, with data, for example, but also with anything. And this is going to be about how um, the approach that we've taken, um, or maybe the approach that we've ended up taking, um, we think is one way that you can engage with people um, in a city, and uh, that city in this case is Leeds. We've done, we've just begun this week design work on our 28th um, Leeds issue, which those numbers are starting to get bigger and bigger. And at the same time, we've sent uh, Manchester issue one is at the printers, number three in Sheffield is at the printers. We've done one in York. We're looking at Liverpool, but Leeds, um, Leeds is where we are. Um, so it feels like Leeds is where we're going to be uh, most usefully talking about tonight. Um, and this is Leeds. And I think the point we're going to uh, get across here is that although we're in Leeds, the Leeds that the City Talking talks about isn't always the Leeds that people know about. Um, and uh, yeah, and that's pretty much the point. And that's a very fast clicker as Liam found out. I tried to learn from him, but I've fallen at the first hurdle. Um, it wasn't always the point. Um, we've tried a lot of things with the city talking. Um, we've evolved, which is a neat way of saying that we've tried a lot of things that haven't worked, which has been one of the best things about making 28 issues so far. We've had the ability with the paper to try new things and to follow our instincts and come up with answers to questions that I'm not even sure anyone was asking. We haven't been bound by traditions or by expectations or by what anyone else is doing. The only things that have really bound us have been the city that we're writing about and our imaginations. And those things haven't actually been restrictive at all. One of the questions people ask when you make something like the city talking is, who is it for? Which is a vital question because if it's not for anybody, nobody's going to read it. It's also a hard question because as far as we're concerned, the city talking is for everybody. We're firm believers in busting out of predefined buckets of interest. You can interest anybody in almost everything, and I think everybody is ready to be interested in, in, in anything. One of the best pieces of feedback I had for a long interview we did recently with David Batty, who, if you don't know, was a Leeds United player in the 1990s, um, was someone who said, I never liked David Batty, and I don't even like football, but I really enjoyed reading that article. There's a preconception that just because somebody is, for example, middle-aged and works in a bank, they won't be interested in reading about a niche comic book artist. But if you think about these people's homes, you have no idea what these people's homes are like or what they're like in their homes. When we write about a young up-and-coming artist, for example, I'm always conscious that one of the people who have to impress with that article is their mother and their mum's mates and people their mum doesn't like but wants to impress. So suddenly, You've got this whole readership of middle-aged women for an article about a trendy artist, and that takes some thought of like how you're going to make that work for everybody. One of our other important answers to the question of who the city talking is for was the result of some reverse engineering. If you've ever done a Google image search for Leeds, you'll know exactly what you're looking at when you look at that image. Um, that is the result of a Google image search for Leeds screenshot and put on a, a slide. What you won't have found is that, which is the top of City House, right in the centre of Leeds, or that, 
which is the top of Hedrow House, which is also in the centre of Leeds, and they assure me that by the time it's finished, the lake will be gone. And you won't have seen it looking like this. This won't show up on Google image searches. Or like this. And yet it's all the same place. All of this is Leeds. But the only place that Leeds looks like this is in the city talking. And if it wasn't in the city talking, it wouldn't be anywhere because Leeds only looks like this to you if you have a certain bend to your imagination that is like ours. Because this is how Leeds looks in our imagination. And that's why Leeds looks like this in the city talking. And that's why it's difficult to explain sometimes what the city talking is or who it's for or what it does because we think it's a newspaper where the news is that Leeds is a romantic city full of interest and beauty and then we tell people that and then people look at us and they say, Leeds. And we're like, yeah, Leeds. And then we're like, well, yeah, we know. Because it isn't New York, and it isn't Paris and it isn't Tokyo. And if I mention those cities, your mind immediately fills with images from films and TV series and fashion magazines. You know exactly the feeling I'm trying to communicate. I don't have to do any work because the connotations are already there. Paris, Champagne, Moonlight. You've got it. Leeds. Leeds has none of the connotations, but all of the mystery, all of the romance, to us anyway. Until we make a new issue of the paper, the romantic stories we tell about the brilliant people and beautiful places we feature only exist in our imagination. But we go beyond imagining it. We bring it to life in print. And when other people see it, they recognize it. And they recognize it and like it. And they might go back to the Google Images world as soon as they close the paper. But I like to think that something of our worldview has stayed with them and that they're starting to believe in it too, the way that we do. And that's why they'll pick up the paper again. People pick up and read the city talking because they want to spend time in the leads that we imagine, create, and share with them. That's the feedback we get, and that probably has been the most significant feedback we've had. People saying how much they've enjoyed reading the paper, which is different to how people normally react to reading a newspaper. They might say, I read in the paper today that, and they'll mention that something has happened or some facts that they learned. But with us, they say, I really enjoyed reading the article in the city talking that said, and it's that enjoyment it's the difference, the act of reading and looking and spending time turning our pages is what brings people back to the city talking. And that's what we're now applying to everything that we do. When we went to York, we wanted to learn about the city and they had just launched their open data website, so that was one place where we went to learn as much as possible about the city through its data. And then we told people what we found out. But we didn't do it by presenting the raw data, we did it by telling a story about a man sitting in a coffee shop writing postcards, including the things he'd found out in York on his holiday. And uh, it was written from his point of view, and this is the point where this just straight up turns into me reading things because I am a writer and so this is the easiest way to share it with you without just giving you homework. Dearest sister, I wrote, selecting a picturesque view of Parliament Street, having a lovely time in York, wish you were here. I was quite sure my sister was happy where she was, but that's the sort of thing one writes on postcards. Even without you, the streets of York are very busy. I'm sending you a picture of Parliament Street. On October 11th, 2014, 57,580 people were counted passing by here. That was the most of any day that year in York. I wonder why there were so many. I signed the card and almost put it to one side, but I thought of a postscript. P.S. I wrote along the edge by her address. Only 4,205 people walked down Church Street that day. It's only a short walk. I wonder why so few. And that is a different way of presenting raw data that, I mean, that story to, to continue it on ends with him flinging postcards around a coffee shop and being politely asked to leave. But the facts are there for you to then think, well, why were so many people on one street that day and yet hardly any on the street around the corner? And it's those questions that I think open data seeks to open up um, and invite people to try and answer. Ah, God damn it. <laughs> you can see it with the bit of chrome around it. One of the other places we're applying it um, is to film. We're very close to finishing a documentary about music in Leeds, and I'm happy to say that it isn't obvious. It isn't a Google image search. Yes, thank you. Um, 
That might mean that people watching it will have to use their imaginations a little bit, but that's what's so great about storytelling. What we do, and the reason why we can call it storytelling, is that we try to fill the gap between reality and our imagination by making our imaginations real. And so what it all boils down to is that we make stuff up based on how we feel about things. And when you have that as a rule, and you apply it to newsprint, to online, to film, to data, it opens up a lot of possibilities. I'm going to end with a bit more reading because um, it's where I express myself best is writing. Um, and I wrote this the morning after the Majestic burnt down, that is the roof of the Majestic, um, which is a fire that I watched from start to finish, but I didn't start. <laughs> it was entirely coincidental that I was able to get there quite early in the state in, in, the, uh, in its progress and, and know where to stand and watch it burn, but I did not start that fire. Um, <laughs> And the next morning, uh, Shang Ting, who is our art director, walked up there to take photographs of um, the damage. And I sat in the office and tried to put into words what I felt the night before as I watched the fire. And I think the results said a lot about how the city talking works. And so this is some um, of what we worked, of what we put together. Uh, the majestic fire started very quietly, and I was wondering what the fuss was all about. The sight of the majestic roof ablaze grabbed the headlines later you probably missed the best part, the noirish view of a deserted Quebec street, the Hollywood smoke effect making the great stone edifice of the Queen's Hotel not so much tower as haunt. It would have been a great night to bump off a gangster rival in the alleys between Quebec Street and Wellington Street. And I called back to something that I wrote that was to do with Leeds Art Crawl, actually, which is an open data initiative, um, which was where I found out how unwelcome a lot of the beautiful buildings around City Square were when they were first built. The Yorkshire Post absolutely hated the post office that now forms that entire listed side of the square. Um, a building you would never think about knocking down now, but back then they were quite happy to knock buildings down to, uh, to build something new like the Majestic, which itself is on the side of the Club Cloth Hall. And if people had had the, uh, the attitude to heritage then, I'd go on to argue, uh, the Majestic would probably never have been built either, and nobody would have ever watched films there, danced there, fallen in love there, fallen out of love there, fought there, or laughed there, or walked into City Square this morning and been struck into silence by the sight of the burned Majestic. The Majestic fire started very quietly, and the building is very quiet again now. When things are quiet, though, is when you can hear your heartbeat. You hear a reminder to love. And that's pretty much what the city talking is. It's a heartbeat, and it's a reminder to love something. And in this case, it's a reminder to love Leeds. And that's pretty much all I can tell you about it at the moment. <laughs>